my name is Dylan Burke. Welcome to day two of GopherCon 2022. I know generics is the cool new toy that everyone is excited to play with, but I'm here to talk about the last hot new thing, Go modules, and how we can make them a bit less like a monster from Greek mythology. First, a little bit about me. I started coding, writing basic as a teenager in the mid 80s, graduated from LSU in 1999, and in the 22 years since, I worked for several different industries and quite a few different languages. Um, in 2016, I took a job at a startup and I switched from .NET and C Sharp to Go. And honestly, I've never looked back. Um, as I said, I started at CrowdStrike almost exactly three years ago in October of 2019, part of our team that manages host level metadata, host names, IP addresses, that kind of thing. I moved to the new team that I now lead in August of 21. From the beginning as a company, CrowdStrike was fully on board with remote work. Um, I live in South Louisiana. I've only been to an office twice. One of those was when I was interviewed. In fact, here's a live shot of my home office back in Louisiana. Quick aside before we get into technical stuff, uh, at CrowdStrike, we stop breaches. There are lots of cool technical projects going on day to day, including the one I'm talking about today. But at the core, what we do is prevent bad guys from compromising your system. We do that by writing Go, a lot of it. We have hundreds of internal modules that bring in a lot of third-party dependencies. That dependency Kraken and all of its tentacles is just as dangerous to our code as all of our uh, adversaries you see up here are to our customers. This project is the direct result of us dealing with that problem. And before we get into the wonders of today, let's take a little trip down memory lane. In the beginning, there was GoPath, and things were simple. There was one and only one place where Go code could be, in GoPath source. Technically, GoPath could reference more than one folder, but it seems like that was actually pretty rare in practice. This created a problem, though, when separate projects needed to use different versions of the same dependency. Initially, the only way to handle that was to have multiple workspaces. The Go team acknowledged that, and in Go 1.5, we got vendoring. With vendoring, the Go tools would look in a package local vendor folder first before falling back to GoPath source. And then in 1.6, vendoring graduated from experimental to officially supported. Things were simple back then. Finding the code that your project depended on was pretty straightforward. Almost always, all you needed was a little bit of find and grab. Uh, unfortunately, there were some downsides. You had to do extra work to handle multiple versions, and builds were not reproducible by default. Fast forward a few years and Go 111 introduce modules. A module is defined as a collection of Go packages that are released and versioned and distributed together. This directly ad addressed those shortcomings by allowing different projects to reference different versions without the extra work of vendoring and making builds almost always reproducible because each build will use this deterministic version of each dependency based on the minimal version selection algorithm and verify the contents of that dependency using the checksums in go.sum. Builds can still fail if something disappears. I mean, we all remember leftpad.js, but still things are better now. Trade-off is that those simple folder-based search tools are not as useful anymore. Source code for dependencies is now in version-specific folders in your local module cache, and you need to know which version of that dependency your project is referencing in order to search in the right place. As an example, right now on this machine, I have 30 different versions of golang.org xsys in my mo local module cache. Obviously, IDEs can jump directly into your dependencies. That only works for the project you have open. At CrowdStrike, we have hundreds of projects, so that's not really an option. Since finding grep are out, let's talk about other options. Running go list minus m all outputs a list of your module's dependencies along with their versions. The UX could really use some polish though. The project I'm talking about today, Perseus, has 51 required dependencies in its go.mod, but go list outputs 121 results. There's also go mod graph, which outputs module dependencies as a list of tuples, where the first item is one of your dependencies and the second is a module that it depends on. Each dependency can and almost always does appear several times. Again, the UX is not the best. The graph of Perseus is 607 lines. Obviously, you could write scripts to parse and process this output and make it more 
user-friendly, but that's not a simple thing to do. Also, both look at the current version of your module. You need to manually check out prior versions of your code to analyze them. And neither provide a way to navigate down the graph and see what things depend on your project. For that, we can look at the package site for help. Each package has an importer's view that lists the packages that depend on yours, except it shows packages, not modules. So it doesn't really help us with module dependencies. It can only show packages that are in public repositories. And it's not directly version aware. You can navigate back out to the containing module, pick a different version, then navigate back to the package to see, but again, that's not the best UX. And as I said, CrowdStrike has a lot of internal modules, so we needed a different solution. Like the mythological hero swooping in to save Andromeda from the monster, Perseus has come to defeat the Kraken that is Go module dependency trees with their multitude of tentacle. To do that, he builds up a graph of version to version module dependencies by expecting the module source code, specifically the go.mod files. There's a server API for updating and querying the graph and a CLI for interacting with that service. We'll start out today's tour of the project with the database itself. There's a wealth of options out there for graph databases, but we ended up just deciding on Postgres. The main factors were that we had lots of existing infrastructure for running Postgres, and the database model is almost trivially simple, really just two vert vertices and two edges. We also have several internal teams that have built their own graph databases. I talked to them, and almost across the board, the answer was, you ain't going to need it. You just don't use a bazooka for swatting flies. Speaking of that simple data model, here it is. A module is a module, identified by its module path, like github.com and CrowdStrike Perseus. Module version is a reference to a version plus excuse me, reference to a module plus the semantic version. And module dependency is a many-to-many -many join table that represents that bi-directional edge between two module versions. Since Simver is really a structured format, it's three dot-separated integers followed by an optional pre-release suffix, you can't just use the plain string to store it and operate on it. And to no one's surprise, Perseus has to compare semantic versions a lot. To deal with that, we use the PG Simver Postgres extension. It adds a Simver data type to the database with support for comparing and supporting and sorting Simver strings. A couple of gotchas though, Go module version strings have a V prefix on them. So the service code needed to strip that off on the way in and add it back on the way out. Second gotcha is that Amazon RDS doesn't support this extension. So if you run it, you have to run Postgres yourself. We also had a pretty good idea up front that we'd be dealing with a lot of versions. So we went ahead and added an index over module and version in the database to help us out with query performance. The project itself generates a single executable that is both the server and a CLI for interacting with it. There's also a public package with the generated gRPC API and a Swagger definition for REST API clients. Something I like to do with this kind of project is to use CMUX to serve HTTP gRPC, health checks, metrics, etc., all on a single port. I find it much easier than having to configure separate ports for each interface. The CLI uses that generated gRPC client to connect to the server and update or query the graph. It also does formatting of the raw API results. The Perseus service is actually pretty straightforward. There's a CRUD API for updating and querying the graph with deletes coming soon, Spaceballs reference. Today, we have an update API for adding modules and module versions and for updating module dependencies and query APIs for listing modules and listing module dependencies. All the updates are done as transactional upserts so that graph changes are identical. In addition to the API, the service also has a basic web-based UI for viewing and navigating the graph. For now, it's pretty simple, but we're, we'll be improving it in the future. As a quick side note, kudos to Buff for Buff Generate. If any of you guys are here, y'all are awesome. There are also some explicit non-goals for the service. 
the service does not do graph traversals. Each call of the API returns one level of dependencies and it's left to the clients, including the Perseus CLI itself, to handle recursing or not. Large graph walks could easily create performance and responsiveness issues, and we just decided to avoid it. Service also doesn't do rendering or visualizations. Just like with graph walks, rendering can get quite expensive. Plus, pulling in additional dependencies like GraphViz increases the attack surface of the service's deployment. And we are a security company after all. It also became obvious pretty quickly that different consumer use cases would require different behavior and visualizations, and we didn't want to bake anything into the service too early. Keep it simple is an advice for a reason. Um, by not complicating the service, we were able to avoid code churn as we were building things out. Flipping the coin, the Perseus CLI is able to analyze our modules and update the graph. The Perseus update command takes a path to a folder that contains the source code for a Go module and parses the go.mod file on disk. For today, that folder needs to contain a git repo with go.mod at the root, but we'll expand on that later. If the version isn't specified, we'll try to deduce it by reading the git tags at the current commit. By default, we skip pre release tags, but that's overridable. And like before, we chose to keep it simple and not try to recursively process module dependencies. You can run Perseus on each module yourself. Now that we have all these pieces in place, we need to populate the graph and keep it up to date as new versions are released. As I mentioned earlier, one of the gaps in the current tooling is determining which modules depend on your module. The catch is that that information really only exists in those projects go.mod files. The GitHub repo for the project includes a bash script that can enumerate all the simver tags on a repo and execute Perseus update for each one. For our internal modules, we backfilled the graph for all of our code by iterating over each, re each repo and running processmod.sh on each one. Doing this, we were able to build up the full graph one set of links at a time. We also integrated the Perseus CLI into our CI process. When a new stable module version is tagged, there's a Jenkins hook that runs Perseus update to add that version and its dependencies to the graph. I know what you're thinking. Really, how much of a problem is this? Does it warrant all this? Everything's in the module cache. We're not supposed to have to worry about this, thing, this kind of stuff anymore. The short version is, it's probably bigger than you think. I took a sample of 127 of our internal modules. The dependency trees contain 4,000 versions of 350 unique modules and a total of just over 95,000 dependency edges. And that's not close to our entire code base. And as each of those modules get future releases, that number is only going up. Now that we have all this data, how do we make use of it? For that, the Perseus CLI provides a query command with three subcommands. Query list modules returns a list of the modules in the Perseus database that match a provided pr pattern. Following the parent child lineage analogy, query ancestors returns things that the module depends on, and query dependence shows modules that depend on it. On these next few slides, we'll look at some examples of Perseus query. This one lists the path and version of direct dependencies of Perseus itself. Since no version is included in the query, the results will be for the most current known version. The output is 16 modules, which matches the list of required modules in the project's go.mod. This next one generates a columnar list of Perseus's direct and indirect dependencies within four degrees of separation. You can see forth from the bottom, there's an extra indirect reference to golang.org x6 xsys compared to the last slide. And here are a few examples of querying down the graph to show things that depend on a particular module. The first shows the path and version of all the, mo all the modules that directly depend on CMUX at version 0.1.5, which is just three versions of Perseus in this example. I also use the option to apply a Go text template to the results to format the output. In this case, dot name calls the name method on the result, which returns the module path and version with an at in between. 
second one shows the same thing but as a table, and the last deduplicates the results by module path by applying a different text template and then piping the results through unique. With a little bit of terminal foo, we can also generate dot directed graphs and make pretty pictures. The first command generates the image on the right, and the second one generates the one at the bottom. These simple commands are part of why we chose not to do visualizations directly in the server. The API builds and returns the dot directed graph content, and it only takes a little bit of extra work to turn that into these nice pictures. I wasn't brave enough to tempt the live demo gods, but I do have some screenshots of the Perseus web UI. This one shows a list of the modules in the database. Clicking on a module opens another view that shows that module's dependencies or dependents. The module detail view lets you select a version and direction, then shows a single level of dependencies. You can dive down through the graph by clicking on any of these nodes. This shows the direct dependencies of version 0.8.0 of CS Proto, another CrowdStrike open source project. And here we have a few more query examples. First, we'll generate a JSON document containing things that depend on version 1.12.1 of github.com example foo. The other two are emulating go list minus m all in either direction. And remember, you can't do that last one with go list. We can do even fancier things by employing a little bit of bash. This example outputs a list of inception modules, modules that depend on prior versions of themselves. Fun fact, Go still enforces that there are no package level import cycles, but there's nothing that stops a module from depending on a ver prior version of itself indirectly, which makes for some fun times if you're running a tool like Dependabot. Every release of that module triggers an update to itself a few days in the future. We actually found one of these in our own code base using this query and are in the process of fixing it now. And this one reports where the most current version of a module depends on a specific version of a dependency, say one with a reported CVE. A CVE can be considered patched, at least from a code standpoint, if the module's latest release doesn't depend on the vulnerable version. But just searching for any reference to that module and version would generate false positives since it would include older versions of your modules. This short script combines query list modules to get the latest version of each module in the github.com example org and query ancestors to show its dependencies. The shady code onos module has a vulnerability in version 1.42.13, so we want to make sure that everything has been updated to a newer release. The current module tooling is not ideal, but we applied a little bit of elbow grease and we were able to address those shortcomings pretty easily. Perseus has served us well, and we hope he can do the same for all of you. We have plans to make Perseus even better, things like a nicer UI and GraphQL APIs have come up, along with adding Perseus query subcommands for the common things like the examples that I showed before. We're also looking to add support for reading dependencies for public modules from module proxies or version control, and possibly publishing pre-built Docker images for running the server. Project is available on GitHub at github.com CrowdStrike Perseus, so everyone go check it out. Looking forward to seeing ideas for making Perseus even more powerful in the future. Before I go, I have to give credit where credit is due. Creative Commons and public domain images are wonderful, but don't just use them, cite the artists. And also, open source is awesome. Couldn't have built Perseus without PG Simver, CMUX, and GRPC Gateway. And go check out Buff, they're doing good things. That's it. Thank you all very much.